Hey everybody, uh, this week's podcast is actually a recording of another podcast. We have a, a very good friend of ours, Tony Peterson. He's got Sporting Dog Talk, which is a, a podcast that I highly recommend you subscribe to. Um, I do, and I listen to almost all of them, or I have listened to almost all of them. Uh, Tony reached out to us, um, very generous, w- asked us if we would uh, record some podcasts with him. So uh, he knows my family well. Steph knows him well. Um, it was really interesting because he interviewed Steph and did a separate podcast, and then he, he interviewed me later. Um he has been generous enough to share that audio with us, so I wanted to share it with you. I also think um, it's a great way for you to get a feel for Tony and his podcast. So I highly recommend subscribing to the Sporting Dog Talk podcast, and I actually found this one pretty interesting as well. Um, it was my my beautiful bride who has a real interesting perspective and knows me better than anyone. Um I hope you enjoy it. I think it gives you a little bit of insight into our lives. But enjoy the podcast, and thank you again for all the support. Sporting Dog Talk here, and I have a special guest. Uh, Stephanie Moore is her name, Um, the better half of Jeremy Moore, who uh, is is most well-known in the the dog world for – Training shed dogs, training deer dogs. Uh, Jeremy's Jeremy's had a place on North American Whitetail TV. He's he's been all over, and uh, really the the foundation for everything Jeremy has done is Stephanie, right, Stephanie? <laughs> I'm glad I finally get credit. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> well, well, you deserve it because I I know Jeremy pretty well. Um, we've we've spent quite a bit of time together, and for you to uh, to put up with him the way you do, um, I think you deserve a lot of credit. Well, you know, he always talks about how important patience is with dog training, and and we re- relate that a lot to life and in our marriage, especially. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I I got to tell you a story um, before before we get into this. Do you remember at ATA? I think it I think it was two years ago when you were talking about your birthday or your age. And I and I made some joke about how uh, I was like, "Wow, I can't believe that's your age because you look so much older." And you punched me. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, that was. See, that's one of those things where just sometimes men aren't thinking the way that they. <laughs> so <laughs> and you just talk before it comes out, and then you just yeah. So don't say that again to another woman. I I suggest. <laughs> so so the reason I bring that up is because Kate, our producer who you just met, she, she's been known to punch people simply because they don't like dogs. Um, so I thought you two would get along well because Kate's a rock star too, but she will throw down if you don't like dogs, which is why she's such a good fit for this podcast. I don't even know where to start with you. You have so much going on um, you know, with, with the businesses, the outdoors business, with Dog Bone. Um, you're, you're also involved in uh, – is it Tough Mudder or Mud Run? It's Tough Mudder, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm an ambassador for Tough Mudder. Um, and I, I do work full-time for corporate America, too. So there's just certain things that I'm involved with with the business regarding the dogs. And, and life is pretty crazy. We keep a pretty tight schedule. Yeah. And and you – can you just kind of run down – how your life came to be so centered around dogs. Cause I know you're busy and I know you have kids and I know you have a lot of stuff going on, but you know, I follow your social media posts and you are posting dog stuff all the time. And it's just, I, you, I can tell that, you know, one of the main centers of your life are these dogs. So can you just kind of, kind of tell us about how you got into that? Yeah. I mean, before, Jeremy and I got together too. I've always been an animal person and a dog lover. I've grown up with dogs all my life. So our family's never gone without having one. Um, and then when him and I met, obviously we had that in common. And and it's funny kind of going back to the story because he used to actually be in construction. That was his background. And, and yep. I used to bartend and he used to come in and visit me. And, you know, he was doing the typical hitting on the bartender thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> but this was right. It was probably back in 2008, I'd say, 2007, 2008. And he was telling me this idea that he had about this shed dog business. And I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't a hunter or anything like that until I was with Jeremy. So it was intriguing to me to be able to hear about it and hear about the backstory of it. And that was when he was really just launching 
this idea that he had about dog bone and about the shed system and everything like that. And I was like, go for it. You know, we were just friends at the time. And so I was supporting him from that standpoint. Um, he was, he had his own personal dog, obviously his hunting dog and was training, you know, one or two dogs here and there just for some friends and some clients on the side. And as the business picked up and we started dating, (laughs) you know how that story goes. Um, Eventually, we were together, moved in together, everything like that, and things progressed. And while that was all progressing, the business was progressing at the same time. So it was it was kind of, it was cool to be able to see him grow that and be a part of it um, and just watch him take his dreams and, and bring them to fruition, pretty much. But one of the big components of it is the more publicity that we got with it and the more that the business grew the more questions that we had, like, do you guys take dogs in? Do you train dogs? This and that. And, um, we were working with a kennel primarily and in the way that we typically would train dogs, we didn't take them in. We would, you know, we take them as puppies and then we keep them anywhere from a year to two years, sometimes depending on how the training goes and what they're looking for in the process. So I've always loved it because me being a dog lover anyway, I'm just like, yeah, like bring them all like the more the merrier. And so it was, it was fun on that end, but keeping them in our home with us and they, they all become a part of our family because like I mentioned, we have three personal dogs, um, Taylor, Ellie and Spry. And then right now we have four dogs in training, for example, that we've had for anywhere from six months to a year. So you get pretty attached to them obviously because they're living in your home with you and, and it's like having, you know, seven kids right now. (laughs) So Taylor, a lot of people know of her, but she's essentially my dog. So she's one that I obviously post the most about on social media because she's with me all the time. You know, I'll bring her on the road with me for work. Um, She's the one going for runs with me. She's doing everything on that end. And then we're also hunting in the field with her. She's certified as a therapy dog. So she's just, you know, my little sidekick. But then all of them, you just end up getting attached to them anyway. So that's kind of the backstory and how we got to where we are with it, if (laughs) if that makes sense. So you, you mentioned Taylor and I've, I've, I've spent some time with that dog and she, she's such a sweetheart, but you also mentioned that Jeremy was a gruff construction worker while you were bartending and he came in and he was, he was throwing you pickup lines left and right, but they worked, right? Somehow, some way they worked. He's, he's kind of <laughs> no, a smooth no. character. <laughs> yeah. He did. He did. He didn't have the big, uh, the big beard back then, did he? No. And he was like, I always told him that he used to look like Eric Church because he was the typical <laughs> the guy. He'd come in and he'd have his pearl snap button down on and his five o'clock shadow, no beard, shorter hair, always with a baseball hat. And so, yeah, I've, I've definitely watched him transition as a person <laughs> and as his personal style. <laughs> as well. He's, he's <laughs> gone. Years, so. he, he has gone almost full lumberjack on us, hasn't he? He has. And there were a couple of years ago, there was a point where the beard was pretty out of control. And was, he's actually trimmed back on that. But but yeah, he's developed his own style in that sense. Did, did you make him trim the beard? I did not. I did not. Wow. You know, I I think we both kind of have that thing. If you're happy, I'm happy. And I love him no matter what he decides to do. And so I just let him go through his own, his own fashionable phase, if you will. That's on him. <laughs> As long as he keeps it out of the sink. You know, I hear a lot of horror stories about about wives whose husbands have beards and they're trimming it in the sink and leaving that stuff all over. And thankfully, he's always been fantastic about that. So until that day comes, knock on wood, he can do whatever he wants with his facial hair. <laughs> that's um, that is that's not a direction I expected we would go. And, and not <laughs> something when you look at Jeremy, I wouldn't expect him to be a clean beard trimmer. <laughs> So, so, so we're learning something on him. Um, so tell me, you know, you're, you're working a full-time job. You're, you're helping out with training these dogs. You know, you, you mentioned Taylor's a therapy dog. Um, just, just give me a rundown. Like, what are you doing with these dogs, personal dogs and the dogs you guys have in to train? Like what's, what's a day-to-day life for Stephanie with some of these dogs? Yeah. And And that's been transitional too, because at the beginning when I was getting into hunting and the training was picking up and I've always had not a formal dog training background. I mean, I always call it poodle tricks. Like I did everything fine with the dogs that I had growing up where they sit, stay, come, heal, hear, hear things like that. 
you know, they'd roll over, keep treats on their nose and throw them up and catch them like all that stuff that dogs don't need to know, but it's cool to have them. (laughs) That stuff I could do. But the new part to me was all of the hunting commands and the field work and everything, which I was fascinated by. And, um, traveling with Jer and going to all of his seminars and obviously having the dogs at the house and working in the field here, I've naturally picked up and and learned that. And by watching his DVDs while reviewing them and things like that. So he's like my own teacher that I live with when it comes to field work like that. So there was a phase a couple years ago where I was like, yeah, let's do this together. That'll be awesome. But there is that balance where He's also my husband. And then so he'd correct me and he'd tell me things to do. And I'm like, don't tell me <laughs> you know, because all of a sudden he's turning into my teacher and, he, and he's, he's telling me what to do. So we butted heads a little bit on that end, um, but we got through it. And and one of the tough parts was just from a scheduling perspective, because we have our, our warehouse for the businesses on our own property. So we have our home and then we have the warehouse down the driveway. So for him to be able to grab the dogs throughout the day and work them for 15 minutes, a half an hour, an hour. He can integrate that within his day, which was really tough for me, obviously, because I'm not here and I'm working on the road. And so then it would be hard because there were some times that I would come back and if it was on the weekend or something and he was gone on a hunt or whatever it was, I'd be like, okay, you know, I grab one of the younger dogs and work on retrieves or trailing memories or things like that. And then I would call him and tell him how it went. And he's like, you can't do retrieves with her right now. She's teething or she's doing hold conditioning. You know, we're not supposed to be doing retrieves during hold conditioning. I'm like, (laughs) so there was just sometimes this disconnect on communication, which we talk about all the time. You have to have awesome communication to be able to, to do that. But it just became too tough with our schedule for me to be able to help with a lot of the field work on that and work together. Mm -hmm. So I'm satisfied now doing a lot of help with the foundation work. So, you know, on a day-to-day basis, that's where we, as a family, we have two kids as well and one on the way. So we're going to have another full, full (laughs) pack, but with the kids as well, that's something that we always make sure to stay consistent with doesn't matter what stage they're at in the morning, we can always work on them being patient for feeding, you know, is something that I'll do and being able to send them on their food. And then when I go for runs or bike rides or, or walks, making sure to stay consistent with the heel work and helping those dogs work on that. And then patients, you know, sitting and, and doing small drills like that on our walks that aren't necessarily formal. Um, but that that's the biggest thing that I think, you know, some families struggle with is one person trying to train yep, and then everybody else in the family untraining <laughs> that dog essentially because there's no consistency. Yep. So I think that's the biggest part that I've played in that is just being able to help with that foundation work, knowing what we, we do with, you know, sending the dogs in the hallway when they're puppies and sending them on their food and things like that, that can set up the field work for Jeremy when he gets into the field with them. Yep. So I I really want to get into that because what you just brought up uh, is so important to training dogs. And we see this, I mean, you guys have seen this a million times, but somebody gets a dog and that person, especially if it's a hunting dog, it's usually the guy, you know, but not always, but he'll get a hold of that dog and the rest of the family doesn't follow the rules. And so you're trying to train this dog and, you know, you're talking foundation work and how important that is for the, you know, the next level stuff, the field work comes later. You know, if you, if you don't have a dog that listens and obeys and, and understands those basic commands, they never advance well beyond that. And what you're talking about is, you know, not only with your personal dogs, but these other dogs that come in every time that you're hanging out with them, doing whatever exercise, whatever you're working on that obedience and reinforcing those those commands in a way where the the consistency there is there always with that dog. And that, that point, like you can't make that enough to the average dog owner that everybody in the family has to be on the same page or that dog is going to find those ways where it can slip back to bad habits all the time. So what you're talking about is insanely important in the development of all dogs, right? Yeah. I think it's something that's not talked about enough too, especially when, cause we see it all the time when people get new puppies and if they have kids and I have, you know, two of my best friends right now have young pups and 
and they also have young kids. And there's that, that stage where you just, they say, well, I just want them to be a puppy wrestling with them on the floor and they're chewing on your hands and this and that. And all of a sudden, you know, six months from now, that stuff's not cute anymore. <laughs> you yep. know, they've got the puppy up on the couch with them and they're taking naps and this and that. And then all of a sudden the puppy's six months old and he's jumping on and off the couch and he's chewing on the kids and he's nipping and biting. And they're like, you know, oh, we don't want him to do this. And it's like, well, what were you just training them to do for the last three months? Yep. They think you can turn it on or off, but everything that they're doing is learning. You know, it's and Jeremy and I both say it all the time. Like it's no different than raising kids. Like you can't, like everything, every moment of the day they're learning and you can't have your training time that's on or off. Like, oh, I'm only going to raise my kids for an hour a day. The other 23 hours, they can do whatever they want and figure yep. it out. You know, yep. it's constant. And that's where there has to be consistency. Even when you're parenting your children together, like you can't have one parent tell them that they can go do this and the other parent tell them that they can't <laughs> because then the kids is confused, right? Like they don't know how yep. to make you happy at that point. And it's no different with these dogs. Well, and that's, that's such a good point. And I, I think about that and I write about that a lot because I have twin six-year-olds. I have a five-year-old dog. <laughs> and so I went, I went through that where I was like, this freaking dog is no different than what I'm doing with my kids, you know, at, at that age and even now. And it's, it's so hard to get people to understand the importance of that. It's, it's with a dog, you bring that dog home at seven weeks old, that window of opportunity from seven weeks to three months or to, you know, six months or nine months or a year is you, you can, you can make so much out of that dog in that time. And like you said, people are like, oh, you know, I just want them to be a puppy. I want them to run around. The reality is those dogs thrive on structure and they thrive on being asked to do these little tasks, just like a little kid. Like if you let a little kid run wild and free, they're going to do it. They'll go feral on you in a heartbeat. But if you're like, <laughs> hey, let's do this thing, this thing, and then we earn this this time to go catch frogs or you earn your ice cream or whatever, they love that. They want to please you. And so that that parallel, it's you know it and I know it because we're in it with little dogs and little kids, but it's it's so it's such an important lesson that's out there. And and you, you mentioned that people don't talk about it enough. And I think that's a hundred percent true. You know, a lot of people get, uh, you know, a puppy and they're dreaming of triple blind retrieves, right? You know, they get a kid and they're like, well, this kid's playing in the N NFL and it's still like in diapers, you know, like we got to start, <laughs> you know, you got to start small, you know, you got to teach that kid how to walk, talk, read, you could go through the, be polite, you know, that, that little puppy, yeah, you might get to those triple blinds, but there's 800 million baby steps before you get there. Uh, and so I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. And I didn't know, yeah, I've known you for a while, but I didn't know where you'd fall on that. Cause when I see, when I talk to you and I, and I see some of your posts, I'm like, Stephanie seems like a little bit of a softy with dogs. <laughs> so I didn't know where you'd, you'd fall on that. And I think it's awesome that you said that. Cause that obedience, that reinforcement is so important. Yeah. And there's definitely, Jer gets surprised, the kids get surprised, the dogs get surprised, because I have a, a voice and a tone within me that comes out <laughs> <laughs> if they're not doing things that they're supposed to, <laughs> where they know that the attitude needs to change. <laughs> so, uh, so you're saying uh, Jeremy has, has heard that voice a time or two? Uh, his eyes get a little big once in a while <laughs> when it comes. Up, but <laughs> That's awesome. So there's one thing I wanted to bring up with you, I'm just, I'm just curious on your perspective. Um, there isn't anybody out there who knows Jeremy better than you. I would assume. I don't think he has an extra family growing up in Green Bay or somewhere with another wife, does he? I sure hope not. But <laughs> he doesn't have the time for that stuff. So, <laughs> no, I've, I don't think he does. <laughs> no, I've, I've worked with Jeremy and I've known him a long time. And one thing I've always I've noticed about dog trainers is they kind of can be broken into two categories. There's kind of the point A to point B dog trainers that are like, this is how you teach a dog to heal, A, B, C, D, over and over and over again, right? And it's very linear, and it it doesn't sort of take into account the individual nature of a specific dog. And then on the other side is a guy like Jeremy who's – He's, he's got like a philosophical bend to his training where if you're like, hey, Jeremy, how do I teach a dog to sit? 
he'll be like he'll go off into like a 10 minute weaving conversation about what well, what kind of dog is it and what what does the dog react to and it's it's this very different way to look at it um and it's it's not it's not as easy to translate what Jeremy says about dogs to the average crowd cuz they want the answer right now but his process comes from his personal kind of uh you know mentality and just having worked with various dogs is is he like that in everything i mean it, it, in your when when you're bow hunting with him or working with the kids or something like that is he like that where it's it's kind of always we got to think about this and it's philosophical no <laughs> <laughs> you don't see him that way <laughs> No, so he, um, yes, yeah, no, I should say, but you're 100% spot on when it comes to the dogs, because it is opposite of what you hear a lot of trainers out there that do have kennels and they do have training as a, as a full-time business because it's set up into packages, you know, a three, six, nine, 12 month package. And this is what we're going to do in this time. And, and that's where it is so different with us because we pick up those dogs when they're a pup. And like I said at the beginning, it might be a year, it might be two years yeah. when your dog's ready to go home, it's ready to go home, you know? Yeah. And so it, it's really frustrating for those linear people because they're like, well, what do I need to do? We're like, we've had people ask us, like, can you put a calendar together for me of what I need to work on this week and then the next week and then the next week? And it's just people's minds think that way. But, but going back to your question, is he like that in all aspects of life? Um, no. And that's where him and I sometimes butt heads on things because he's like, we need to do this and then this and then this, and then we're going to do that. And it's very, very linear. Um, and then I get more spontaneous or sporadic with things sometimes. So it goes, you know, we both have that in us, but we use it at different times and parts of our lives. So yeah. It, yeah. it's interesting that he does take such a relaxed approach to dog, dog training, but I should say he is very adaptable when it does come to other things in life, you know, whether it's business or hunting or whatever it is that things are always changing and you know that whatever your plan is, isn't going to go as it's supposed to. So, so he definitely is very flexible on that end where if things do need to, you know, get revisited or changed or modified in some way that he definitely can do that pretty well. Well, I, I think when, when I hear, or when I ask Jeremy questions about dogs, dog training, what I feel like is the way that I have to write sometimes where I have to be very careful about the the things I say to not sort of pigeonhole myself. I mean, we, we kind of call it weasel words or basically covering your ass where you're like, if, if you ask Jeremy about this specific dog, he knows there's a hundred variables that go into training every day. And so he's not going to say I can take this dog to, to this point in this amount of time because he knows that they vary so much. So when I hear him, I, th- I think that's probably part of his thought process behind dogs. It's not relaxed. It's like very measured and, and careful because I, I know you, you brought up, um, dogs are ready when they're ready. And I've, I've talked to so many dog trainers and some of them, um, you know, they'll have like a two week program for something and I, I just, I look at this and I go, it, it, you know, this may be just me, like I, not knowing what I'm talking about, but I'm like, how much can you get done in two weeks? You know, I mean, it, it, especially if you're dealing with a little puppy. <laughs> well, yeah, there's, a, yeah. What, what are you going to do? You know, you might, you know, if you take like, you know, bird introduction or gunfire introduction and you say, that's all I want for this dog. Well, if that dog's ready in two weeks, you might get it through that to where it's it's okay with it and you can keep reinforcing that. But that's like, that's taking into account everything that's gone in before and hopefully that's been done correctly. Then that dog might glean something out of a two-week program or something. But generally, it's it's just crazy. And, you know, to get back to the kids, you know, I'm I'm raising two that are the exact same age and watching how different they learn. And then I think about dogs and I'm like, you know, asking both of my daughters to learn how to read at exactly the same pace would be idiotic. It would like two days into it, you go, now one of them's way ahead of the other. And then that one sucks at math and the other one's awesome. Like that's just, they're just individuals and they learn. And we, I think it's easy to look at dogs and think, well, I got this black lab puppy or this British lab, whatever, 
it's going to do this. And it's like, that's an individual, you know, like you, you, you see it with Taylor and Spry and these different dogs that you're running. They're all individuals and they all do different stuff. Yeah. And it, it is interesting that you say that because we have two dogs in right now. They're out of the same litter and they're completely opposite. You know, and, and it's one of those things like you mentioned with with your twins, they have different strengths, different things that they're not so great at. And it's trying to, you know, find that balance of enhancing the strengths that they, they do have, but then also bringing out their weaknesses and where they may be falling short and helping work on those in a different way. And because everywhere that that we bring Taylor or some of our other dogs, like people are like, I want I want you to train a dog like that. <laughs> But, but Taylor, I mean, granted, yes, I shouldn't, the other dogs are in here, but she's my favorite. And <laughs> so, <laughs> and the earmuffs, right? Uh-huh. But, but there's things too that drive us crazy about her. Like she doesn't, she gets a little lazy in the field sometimes. And that's, it's partially because even with drills and everything, like she's like, okay, I've done this before, you know? And <laughs> she's so, so when you're trying to do drills or demonstrations with her, like you can tell she's bored. And so, you know, she's moseying her way back and and we're bringing that out in her. You get her out in the field and it's a different story if it's live birds or ducks or whatever. But, um, but then we have other dogs that it's just, they have that higher drive. They have something that she doesn't necessarily inherently have and and they just all have their own differences, but it doesn't say one's better than the other. They're just different. Yeah. Well, and you know, you spend time around Taylor and it's impossible not to love her temperament and her personality i mean she's just a sweetheart um and you know i i compared her because my dog is an american lab and she's super driven but she will drive you nuts like she's a different (laughs) kind of dog and when i spend time when i spent time with jeremy and we were hunting and i got to spend time with taylor I'm like, I kind of, I kind of want a dog like this. Like my dog's driving me nuts, you know, and it, it my, it's different now um, that she's, you know, five going on six. She's not, you know, she still drives my wife nuts. Let me put it that way, but I, I can tolerate her way <laughs> better, but there's, there's just, there's so much variation in them. Um, and it's, and it's so neat to see. So with your life as busy as you guys are, and I know you're traveling all over and, and you're busy all the time, but you, you have three personal dogs. Like I always, I always look at somebody like you or, or your guys' marriage and I'm like, how do you guys not have 30 personal dogs? Like, how do you not just keep taking in puppies? Like, how, how did you learn to say no? Because every time I talk to somebody who, who breeds dogs, uh, you know, for, for whatever, an article or anything, like my first inclination is I want to get one of those dogs. Like I have to force myself to not just get puppies. Like, how do you do it? <sighs> yeah. And I think a big thing on that, we've realized that our threshold is around six or seven dogs in the house at one time. So there was a point when we only had one that was our personal dog. So we'd have five or six in for training. And as that number's shifted and our own personal dogs have grown it's just meant that we take in less dogs for training yep. because that number still stays the same. And a, a big reason behind that is like you and I talked before the, our dogs, they're all in our home with us. So we don't have a separate kennel building on our property. We don't have somewhere that the dogs can be like, we physically have seven kennels in our mud room and seven places in our living room and around the house. And there's just physically <laughs> no more room. I mean, unless we're just going to cover our living room floor with, with dog bone places, <laughs> then, then that's how we could get around that. But, but physically from a standpoint, there just isn't more room. And from a time standpoint, we obviously want to make sure that we're producing dogs that are everything that we want them to be. And with, Jeremy, a lot of his time is spent on the business. It's not necessarily training the dogs. And my time is spent working or with the kids or all the kinds of stuff that they have for extracurriculars and things like that. So it's not fair for the dogs for us to say, you know, we're going to bring 15 of them in because we know that we don't have the time or the space to give them what they would need. But if you ask Jeremy, he wants a beagle and he wants a pointer. (laughs) (laughs) Not to say that we won't be getting more personal dogs, but it would be, you know, if that situation does change where we end up building a heated kennel building or something like that, where we do have more space. Well, you, you, you said so many things that are, that are poignant there. You've, you figured out what the number is that you want to handle. 
you figured out the number is that you can handle and produce good dogs. Like you, you, you're limiting, you know, it's, I, I don't want to go negative on this, but I've, I've talked to trainers. I've talked to breeders who they're just like, run them through, run them through, run them through. You know what I mean? And it, it's like, if you want to produce a quality dog and give them the time they need to develop into an amazing deer dog or shed antler dog or whatever, it's not in your situation. It's not like you could run a bunch of dogs through. You have to just devote the time to a few of them, churn out an awesome product and keep that going. I think I, the, the, the good lesson in here, and I think this is just cause I'm getting old, but I start to look at, yeah, I am. My wife will tell you, trust me. Um, I'm turning into this crusty old white guy uh, that complains about all kinds of random shit. But what I think, I think happens here, I think the lesson here is people would look at you guys and go, this, this is probably more expensive than a chop shop that's just going to run random dogs through over and over again. But you're paying for quality. Like, what do you want to get out of your dog? Like, what what do you do? You really want the best? Like, do you want to wring the most potential out of this dog and have the best hunter, companion, shed dog, whatever for the 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 nine, ten, eleven years that you have it? Or do you want to save a bunch of money, run it through a short course, and not see where that dog could have ended up? And you know, it's it's a personal decision. It's based on a lot of stuff, but. I look at my own life and just random things that I'll pay up for now because they're worth it. And what what you're talking about, you you've already figured out. You guys have figured out that balance. Like you know what you can handle to create the best product possible, and I think that's awesome. Yeah, and there's a difference because, like you mentioned, and it, it's no right or wrong way. Like trainers can set up their packages their own way. That's fine, but for us, it doesn't benefit to be able to get the dogs out quicker by any means, because we don't do that where it's, you know, three months is going to cost X amount of dollars. Six months is going to cost this. A year is going to cost this. We say your dog start to finish is going to cost this much. It'll take as long as it takes. So for us to have it longer, you know, that's just us having the dog a little bit longer. It's not going to change the cost for the client, for us, for anything like that. So it gives us, it's, it's less pressure feeling like you have to fit something into a timeline. Yeah. Um, it just allows you to work with the dog on their level more than anything. Um, that's if, if anybody listening to this takes away anything from this, I hope it's that, that your entire business is structured to ensure that a dog succeeds or that you, you succeed with the dog, however you want to look at it. It's, it's amazing for me to hear. I love I love hearing from people who've started businesses who who figure that out about themselves and and who their clientele should be and and what kind of product they want to produce. And that point of looking for a trainer. If you if you need a trainer uh, to find somebody who says that to you, like we we don't know how long this will be, but we know where we'll get with that duck. That's a huge, that's a huge thing. Um, and I think it's, I'm so glad you said that because that's so important. Yeah. It gives a peace of mind, I think for everybody, just because there's, there's not that tight timeline that we're trying to fit in. And then the client knows that they're going to have the dog that they're looking for, however long it takes. Yeah. And so you guys, um, Jeremy, you know, just chatting with him, setting this whole thing up. Um, he said, you're having a little trouble finding people to work. Um, just, there, there just aren't that many people available. Is it partially that? And is it partially because you really need to find the right people to fit in? You know, you've, you've got this family owned business. You guys are working every day. These dogs are living in your house. Um, is it, is it that the, the labor pool is so small or is it that there's a very specific type of person you guys would invite into your situation? I think both. Yes, they do. We are, we are a family owned business. And like I said, our, our warehouse is on our property. So, you know, they're coming in and out of the house to grab something to eat, to go to the bathroom, whatever it is. So there needs to be that right fit of that person that we can, um, trust. And, um, I'm not sure if the labor pool is smaller cause they say that unemployment's decreasing. So I don't know if, if that's true or not, but it's, it's just finding that right person because, 
it's helped for them to have an interest in the outdoors or in dogs or whatever it is. Because if you go into the warehouse right now, there's a couple dogs sitting on place. The guy that we have working for us brings his dog with. And so there's that, that personal connection that we definitely need. But the biggest thing is finding that person we can trust because there are days and times where, you know, Jer will leave to go on a hunt for a week or whatever it is. And he's not, you know, looking over your shoulder or things like that. So it's finding that person that not only you can trust, but also has that strong work ethic that when they're the boss isn't there, you know, you know that they're yep. still going to do their job and they're going to do it gently and, and effectively. Yeah. I, I hear that. So you said, um, I was going to bring this up before and I forgot and you just reminded me of it. Um, you mentioned the place command and when I'm thinking, when, when the average person is thinking about somebody who has seven dogs in their house, seven sporting dogs, I'm sure they envision chaos. And that's not the case, right? Because you guys, you guys work hard on that place command. And I think if people could see um, a, a random picture of your living room or your house when all those dogs are sitting on their dog bone places and they're, they're all in their spot, um, it's such a testament to how important that one command is, right? Yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's, if not one of the most important things that we talk about and we try and enforce because it, it's funny. I mean, I, I work, like I said, I'm in sales, so I'm meeting people all day, every day, and, and they're talking, you know, and I get to know them a lot of times and they're like, oh, my life's crazy. You know, I've got a kid and a dog and <laughs> so I just say, I don't say anything. I sit back and so they're like, tell me about yourself. I'm like, oh, you know, we've got two kids, seven dogs, 10 chickens, <laughs> going through the list. <laughs> all of a sudden you see their eyes like, what? Like, how crazy is this person that I'm meeting? And, um, but it, it's such a big difference too, because they're so well behaved. Like right now, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a podcast with you and I, I look around the living room and there's four dogs that are curled up, each one on their place and they're sleeping, you know, and, and that's what I see. Even when I go, like we go to our friend's house and stuff and you walk in the front door and the dog's jumping on you and they're going all crazy and, and they know how our dogs are. So it's always like, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and, but that's yeah. what I've been working on. Even with some of my friends, like we've gotten them places now and, um, and they're training their dogs, some of those younger pups and the older dogs for place training. And they say night and day, 100%, this has made the biggest difference in our life and in our family life because it's huge. Because that's when, like, you meet people that aren't dog people. And this is going back to, you know, Kate saying, like, I don't like people that aren't dog people either. But <laughs> when you find somebody that, that's not a dog person, it's typically because they just haven't been around enough well-behaved dogs. You know, there's yep. there's that that situation that they had where the dogs are either crazy or they got bit or whatever it was. And then they haven't experienced the well-mannered dogs. And, and that makes a big difference for us, too, because... I mean, there was, there's many times that people will come to our house and they walk in and they're expecting like seven dogs to come at them. And they're like, why aren't they moving? Like, are they, are they stuck on those? Or like, we'll bring the dogs to the show and, and they'll be on their place. And we've had all kinds of weird questions. Like, do you drug them? So they're not going crazy at shows or do you like put magnets in their belly and magnets on their bed? So they physically <laughs> can't get off and people are coming out with all this crazy stuff because there's no way that we could have this many dogs in the house if they didn't have that that yep. basic foundation well and it so the, the place command in your life it's a necessity when you've got seven dogs in your house that those dogs have to have a place and a release command so you can control where they are uh, but i think I think people might listen to that and go well i don't know if my dog really needs that but if you duck hunt that's a huge thing to have them, you know, when you're talking steadiness and you get into your boat, your flat bottom or your blind and that dog has his place, if that's being reinforced at home, so you have a well-mannered dog that if you say place, he goes and gets in his spot. Um, if that, if you translate that right to the duck blind or so many different, you go to somebody else's house, you visit somebody else's house and you can tell that dog it's place, uh, that that command is like maybe the uh, the most underrated obedience command out there i think and and it's it's so cool to hear and i've seen jeremy with his dogs i've seen you with your dogs um i've seen how well your dogs stick to it um it's it's so important and that's that's one of the things that you talked about you know random friends whoever dog owners who who maybe aren't familiar with that command or didn't train it or something 
Part of that, I think, I mean, part of it's just being aware of it. Some of, some people don't know you could even do that. The other part of it is just the underestimating dogs all the time. When when people like you talk about dogs, you've seen amazing dogs. You've owned them. You've worked with them. You've seen what they can do. Most people haven't. Like you said, most people haven't seen a well-behaved dog. So, you know, they think you're magnetizing your dogs at a show or something, which is bananas. <laughs> um, if, if you want to uh, – I, I, I used to tell my daughters there are no stupid questions, but I've worked some of those shows <laughs> – <laughs> and I've I've done seminars at them, and uh, I've done a lot of deer hunting seminars. And I'll tell you what, I've heard some stupid questions. That's just a bold faced lie. <laughs> and so I want my daughters to be inquisitive and ask questions, but there is a threshold. Some questions are just stupid. Um, but overall, it, that was that was a little tangent there. But that that <laughs> point you made about the place command and how you handle those dogs. Um, it's it's to me I, I think it's fascinating because it's just a testament to the levels you guys are going to to ensure that your personal dogs are awesome, that the dogs you're training are awesome, and that these dogs are capable of this and so much more. Yeah. Yeah. And it is so important from you said like you said, from a hunting perspective to build that steadiness. You know, the dogs aren't breaking. If they know that they're supposed to be sitting there, they're sitting there. But even when you're not hunting or you're not in that, like you mentioned a couple of my friends that have the dogs, like it makes such a big difference because if they have friends coming over for dinner or something like that, like there's nothing more annoying than sitting there for dinner and having the dogs, you know, come around and they're begging and they're doing whatever. And they're just driving your guests crazy. Or you have people that are coming over that just aren't dog people. And and that's where you can trust your dogs that, you know, go on your place and they'll lay there for a couple hours until your company leaves. And it just, it alleviates that, that stress that you have. But for us, it's just, it's one of those things because like a question that we get all the time, like we're on the road a lot, most weekends we're gone. And, and people always say like, well, how do you travel, you know, with that many dogs? And it's because the places that we're typically going they know how well-mannered our dogs are. So they're like, yeah, you know, bring them along. Or or they just, yep. we have that many dogs with us and they don't know they're there, you know, because we can be able to bring that place or that bed that we have, put it wherever we're going. And the place is their place to the dogs. It doesn't matter if it's in our house. It doesn't matter if it's in a, an arena that we're doing a show at. It doesn't matter if it's at a friend's house. We put the bed down and they lay down. You know, so that's where it makes a big difference from a traveling perspective and just being able to bring them on the road with us and and have that, you know, well-mannered dog. It, it just makes such a difference. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's so cool. And it's, you know, if if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, I'm not a professional trainer, I my dog's not going to get to that level. Um, all of us, our dogs could be better, right? I mean, we can, we can work on our dogs every it, any amateur trainer, any amateur dog owner, you can have a better dog. They're they're full of potential. And when you see something like your guys' dogs, um, to me, that's just like something to aspire to. Yeah, maybe you'll never get there. But if you have, you know, if you have a dog that has any kind of mental bandwidth at all, uh, they can learn place. You know, they can learn obedience commands. They can, they can be well behaved. Um, and there's a lot you can do with them. Uh, Steph, we're just about out of time here. Can you can you tell me sure. where can people find uh, you know social media your your businesses because you guys got a whole bunch of them how can, how can people find you Yeah, everything from the dog perspective, our handles on everything are dog bone hunter. So website is dogbonehunter dot com. Instagram is dogbone hunter. Everything like that. That's the handle um, that you can find find information on it. So okay, perfect. Steph, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, talk a little smack about Jeremy, um, and teach us <laughs> teach us a little bit about your life. Uh, so glad you came on. This was a lot of fun. So thank you. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. And thank you for having me. And if you ever want to talk smack again, just let me know. I'm always open to it. <laughs> we, w- we will, for sure. Believe me. Well, thank you. That's it for this episode of Sporting Dog Talk. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and our YouTube channel. And of course, if you liked what you heard on this episode, please, please, please subscribe. That helps us out so much when we get to see the support from our audience. And lastly, thanks for listening. 